Yeah, okay, so I can't pronounce it either. <laughs> yeah. And here, talk about graph partitions, please. Anyway, uh, thanks for coming and, and thanks for the invitation. This is, this is great. So, um, well, let's see. So, Peter Dukes is my colleague in Victoria. Uh, Steve Loudon was an undergraduate student in Victoria at the time this happened. So, as usually is the case, I'll spend the first little while trying to explain to you what this is about, and then we'll see what we can do with it. So, this is about graph partitioning problems, and the, and the simplest partitioning problem that I can think about is coloring. So, you know, you, you give me a graph, this is supposed to be a picture of five coloring, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to partition the vertices of the graph into five sets. Some of these might be empty, and the edges of the graph, I can't have any edges inside one of the sets, so they're independent, but I'm allowed to have edges between, but I don't have to have edges between. Right, so there doesn't have to be an edge with one end here and another end there, edge there and the other end there. But I'm but I'm allowed to have that. Okay, so the next. Okay, the next step along the way, uh, in 1985, Harari came up with this idea of conditional coloring. So it's the same idea. You you take the vertices of your graph and you partition them into sets and, and maybe you won't allow the sets to be empty or maybe you will it, it depends on what the, the condition is but so each one of these balloons represents a set of vertices that that satisfies some condition or if you like belongs to some well-defined set of graphs and then edges well there could be edges in here depending on what the condition is and there's definitely allowed to be edges between any pair of them so possible examples of things, well, if they were independent sets, then that's just coloring. Okay, if they're complete graphs, then that's the complement of coloring. So, right, that's if you, it's coloring the complement of the graph. But they could be complete bipartite graphs. So each one of these guys in here is some complete bipartite graph, or they could be d degenerate graphs. So, for example, uh, every induced subgraph has a vertex of degree d or less. They could be graphs with a dominating vertex, they could be graphs of bounded diameter, they could be line graphs, they could be anything. Okay, so as, as long as you can describe some collection of graphs, that's the condition. And conditional coloring just says you partition your vertices into, this will be conditional five coloring, so five sets, each of which gives you a subgraph in that collection. Okay, so that's coloring and conditional coloring. And then the other little ingredient is homomorphism. So again, homomorphism is a partitioning problem. And in the background, you've got a graph H. So here H is C5. Okay? And the way I want to think about it is my graph H, the vertices are colors. So I, here I've got five colors, one corresponding to each vertex of C5. And I'm going to assign those colors to the vertices of my input graph G in such a way that vertices that are adjacent in G get colors that are adjacent in C5. So if this is red and this is blue, then adjacent, vertices that are adjacent in G, one of them can be red, one of them can be blue, but you can never have a red vertex adjacent to a black vertex because those don't, those don't correspond to adjacent vertices of C5. Okay, a different way to look at it, you partition the vertices of your input graph into independent sets, and you're allowed to, that's either, these are labeled independent sets, they're labeled by H, and you're allowed to have an edge with an end in different independent sets when, they're, when those sets are adjacent in H. So H is the template, and it tells you when you're allowed to have an edge with an end in one set and an end in the other set. Okay, so what I'd like to do is bring this together with conditional coloring. So you can see what's going to happen. Again, I'm going to have a template H, which will tell me where the edges are allowed to go between sets, and then my sets themselves will induce graphs in some family. Okay. So I say, you know, I know you gave me the clicker, but I, I do it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, well, just while I, while I go, while I finish the slide off. So homomorphism to H, sometimes called H coloring, for the reason that I said, vertices of H are colors. Okay. Or I might color it. K coloring, so this will be 5 coloring with template H, so template C5, because so the template tells you where the edges are allowed to go. 
So okay, so here we go. This is the whole, this is the whole thing, and it's quite a mouthful. Conditional K coloring with condition C and template H. So now the connection here is that K is the number of vertices of H. Okay? So this is going to be conditional five coloring with whatever my condition is going to be and template C5. Alright? So I'm going to part so I'm given a graph G. I'm going to partition the vertices of G into five sets. And so here they are. Inside each set, I'm going to have a graph in a particular collection. And I'm allowed to have an edge with an end in one set and an end in a different set exactly when those are adjacent vertices of C5. Okay? So there it is. So C5 is just the model. I can do this for any H that I want and any condition that I want. So here's an example. So um, suppose I decide that each one of these sets has to be non-empty. So this, this is my condition. It's non-empty and the induced subgraph is connected. And I'll, I'll just for the moment, I'll, I'll make this little extra requirement that I must have an edge with an end here and an end here. Not every possible edge, just some vertex in here must be adjacent to some vertex in here, some vertex in here must be some adja adjacent to some vertex in here, and so on. Then this problem is contractibility to H. Because if you contract all of the vertices here to a single vertex, and here, and here, and here, and here, then what you get is a five cycle. Okay? All right. Okay. So let's see. These are the things we've talked about. So on top here we have K coloring. Okay. Now, can every, so conditional K coloring includes K coloring by just choosing the condition to be has no edges. Okay. Homomorphism to H includes K coloring by taking H to be the complete graph because you're allowing an edge, you know, vertices of different, let me try that again. Any two vertices of different colors are allowed to be adjacent. Okay. And so conditional K coloring with template H, well, if I choose the condition to be independent, I get this. If I choose H to be complete, I get this. Okay, so, so somehow at the bottom, this brings everything together and a whole lot more. And, and so you expect a real mixture of problems. Some of them will be easy, some of them will be not so easy. So here are some examples. Okay, so here, this one, this one we know about. It's just the complexity of coloring. Okay, so, so K coloring, if K is a fixed number of colors, then if you're trying to use one color or two colors, that's an easy problem. You're just asking if the graph is bipartite. And if you're trying to use three or more colors and decide if you can do it, then that's a hard problem. Okay. Um, a generalization of that is this theorem here from 1990 by Helen Neschatrell. This was published in 1990. I think it was proved in about 1986, but that's a different, a different story. What? <laughs> <laughs> so, so they finished proving this theorem just when I was a graduate student at Simon Fraser. And I was a grad student in 1986. The paper didn't come out until 1990. Okay, so... If H is a bipartite graph, remember H is your template graph that tells you where edges are allowed to go. So if H is a bipartite graph, then homomorphism to H is an easy problem to decide, existence of a homomorphism. And if H isn't a bipartite graph, so in particular if it's a complete graph, which is coloring, then that's a hard problem to decide the existence of a homomorphism. Okay? So this is an example of a theorem. Now dichotomy just means into two parts. It's a clear dividing line into two parts. So this tells me exactly which situations the problem is easy and which situations the problem is hard. All right? And it's on the structure of H. So here's another one. This is from 1999. So this is a conditional coloring problem. And my condition here is that every one of those balloons gives me a complete graph. Okay? So partition into clicks. So I'm taking the vertices of my graph G, I'm partitioning them into cliques, and I've got some template H that tells me where the edges are allowed to go between different cliques. And it turns out that if my template H has no triangles in it, so in particular for H equals C5, then there's an algorithm to do that, uh, a polynomial time algorithm to do it. And if H has some triangles in it, then that's a hard problem. This was curious. It was su it's surprising to me. 
Um, now, it turns out that if I change cliques up there to stars, so every one of those balloons gives me a star, right? So a single vertex and a bunch of leaves. I don't know how many, but just a star. Then the statement is the same. And if I change stars or cliques to complete bipartite graphs, then the statement is exactly the same. And so when we submitted this paper, and I don't remember what year that was, but it was prior to 1999, um, the referee commented that, you know, these methods look an awful lot the same, and was there a way to bring them together, or what could we do with them? So what I'm going to try to tell you about in a minute is a way to unify all of this stuff, so to make these three results look the same, and deal with them in a single treatment, and then how much farther you might be able to take that. Okay, so my, my focus is on how far the algorithms can go. I'm not going to worry too much about the, compl about the, the computational complexity and p-completeness. So I'm, try I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to describe to you um, a collection of conditions, so partitioning the cliques as a condition, independent sets as a condition, whatever, where as long as H doesn't have a triangle in it, I can find an algorithm for this partitioning problem. Okay? So it's complicated. It's, it's hard to get your brain around it. So in, in the beginning, just fix in your mind the five cycle. Okay, I'm going to use that as my model. And so, I, so I'm going to have, in the end, I'm going to partition my graph into five parts. One, two, three, four, five. I'm allowed to have edges between different parts, but I don't need to have edges between different parts. And I'm going to try to describe to you what these graphs in here can look like in order for that statement to be true. Okay, so there's an algorithm for the partitioning problem. So, uh, so in here, I want graphs that belong to some family C, and I want to talk about what family C's this works for. What families C this works for. Okay, so in order to do that, I'm just going to talk to you about the partition into cliques. So that was the one. So, so here, um, so C is going to be a set of complete graphs. Okay, so I'm just going to talk to you about the idea behind that algorithm, and then we'll see where that can go. Okay, so you, you hand me a graph G, and what I want to do is I want to answer yes or no, and I want to do it quickly if I can. Can I partition the vertices of G into five cliques? Okay, so that edges between the cliques, if they're there at all, follow the pattern of C5. So I definitely never have an edge from here to here. Okay, now my C5 is labeled. Okay, so these are, these are five labeled parts. <laughs> okay, so, so what's going to happen? Um, so the, the basic idea is that I'm, I'm going to say my complete graphs have to be non-empty. It just makes the explanation easier. I can allow them to be empty and that would be fine. Okay, so my complete graphs have to be non-empty. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to reach into my graph G and I'm going to pick five vertices. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I, I don't know anything about these five vertices at all. I'm just, so it might be that in the end I have to try every possible combination of five vertices, but that's okay. Okay, so these are my five starter vertices. So the first thing that has to happen is that the edges of the C5 have to be respected. Okay, so if this vertex here is adjacent to this vertex here, I can throw these five away and it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, so I'll just move on to my next set of five if that works. So let's pretend that I've got some edges, maybe this one's not there, Okay, but the edges that I do have between these five, they follow this pattern. Okay, so now I'm allowed to continue to the next stage. Okay, so I've passed that test, and if I haven't passed that test, I'll move on. And if I can't fi fi find five vertices that pass that test, I'm done. Okay, the answer is no. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is I want to say, okay, now I'm partitioning my graph into cliques. Okay. So every vertex that I have must belong to one of the parts. And so in particular, any vertex in my input graph has to belong to it, has to belong to at least one of these, so it better be adjacent to one of these five. Because this vertex is in a complete graph. 
Okay, now it could be adjacent to more than one of them. It could be adjacent to two or three. Okay, so, so what do I mean by forced choices? Well, so here's the vertex of my input graph. And if it's adjacent to only one of these five vertices, then I know which complete graph it has to belong to. It's this one. It can't go up here because these two vertices are not adjacent and that wouldn't be complete. Okay, okay so that's one instance of a forced choice. Here's another instance of a forced choice. <laughs> if it's adjacent to three, okay? Because, well, where could it go? If it went here, then I have an edge from there to there, and that's no good. Similarly, if it went there, same thing. So if it's adjacent to three, there have to be three in a row, and it has to go there. Now, it can't be adjacent to four, because no matter where I put it, I get an edge that I'm not supposed to have. Okay, so my other instance of a forced choice is when I have a vertex of my graph that's adjacent to three of these guys, okay, and then I know which one it goes to. Okay, so... Right. Well, so this, this is the whole thing about H being triangle-free. Because if I don't have a triangle, then I can never, if I, if I have three in a row, then, or many in a row, it has to be a star. And so there's a, a well-defined central vertex. And if I had an edge between here, then now I wouldn't know what to do, and that's where the complexity comes from. Yeah, so that, that's where triangle free comes in. It, it actually allows you to force these choices, and allows the next thing that's going to happen to occur. Okay? All right. So, what I'm going to imagine now is that in each one of these balloons, I've got my original vertices and maybe some vertices that were forced to be in there, okay, because they were either adjacent to one or adjacent to several. And that, I mean, at, at this point, I might already know that for this choice of five starter vertices, the answer is no, because these graphs are not complete. Okay, so maybe. Maybe I have two vertices that are forced to be in here and they're not adjacent to each other. So then I, then I know I can't do it. So I move on to my next five. Okay, so let's pretend that I've advanced past that stage. And so I've got all my, my forced choices. They're in my little balloons here. And everything that I've done so far, each of these little subgraphs is complete. And now I still have some other vertices left. Okay, so they're not adjacent to only one. They're not adjacent to three, they couldn't be adjacent to four, they couldn't be adjacent to five. So what's left are vertices that are adjacent to exactly two. Okay, and so this is where the two satisfiability is going to come from. I have to decide if it's going to go here or here. And I have to make consistent choices over all my possibilities. All right. So, um, A, B, C, D, E were really unfortunate choices because uh, in a minute I'm going to want to number them, but we'll just assume alphabetical order. Okay, so here's A, B, C, D, and E. And so A comes before B, B comes before C. Okay, this is what I just said. If you have a vertex that's adjacent to only one of them, it has to belong to that clique. If it's adjacent to three of them, it has to belong to that clique. Okay. Can't be adjacent to four, can't be adjacent to five. So what's left is the guys that are adjacent to two. Okay. And I have to decide where these go. So and just to going to set up a little piece of notation. So EIJ is the set of vertices that somehow correspond to the edge from I to J. So these guys have to go, so EAB is the set of vertices they're going to have to either go in the clique corresponding to A or the clique corresponding to B. So they correspond to the edge AB in my template graph. Okay? Okay. So what's going to go on? So I'm, what's going to happen is I'm going to write down a bunch of um, Boolean statements that involve two literals that I can make all true exactly when I get the partition. Okay, So, Li is the clique 
containing the starter and the force vertices. So, so for example, this set here, which I will just kind of extend a little bit, is LE. Okay, and similarly there's LA, LB, LC, and LD. And now I'm going to try to add vertices to these. Okay, so here's my vertex X, and this belongs to E, A, B. And A comes before B. Okay, so here's my statement, S, S of X, is that I'm allowed to put X in L, A. Okay, so, my, so, so, here, so here's my statement, S of X, okay, X can be put in LA. So in other words, if I add X to this set here, I still have a complete graph. Now I can test that because X would have to be adjacent to every vertex that I've got in there. Okay? And so if that's not true, then I'm going to write down the clause not SX because I'm not allowed to put it there, right? So, in other words, if, if LA union X isn't complete, then X has to go either here or here, I better put it there. So, but similarly, if X is going to go here, I can test whether X union LB is a complete graph. And if that's not true, I can write down the clause S of X, which means I better put it in A. And if, if I have both of those statements, I have a contradiction. But anyway, so the, but anyway, so I get, I get clauses like this, and what these clauses do are they guarantee that whenever I add a single vertex to what I've got, I have a complete graph. Okay, so I can extend whatever is there to a complete graph, and if I can't, then I have a clause that tells me I can't do it. So making that clause true will force the vertex to go somewhere else. Okay, fine. Okay. So now I have to worry about what happens if I have pairs of vertices. So here's a pair of vertices here. I've got X and Y, and my X and Y here are both in E, A, B. Now I've already handled the clauses that tell me whether Y can be added to A, or Y can be added to B, or X can be added to A, or X can be added to B, so I'm not going to worry about those. What I'm going to worry about here or can they, be, can they both be added to the same part? So if X and Y are not adjacent, then even if I can add X to A and it's okay, and I can add Y to A and it's okay, I can't add them both to A and have it be okay. Okay? So, a clause that I might get is either X goes to A or Y doesn't go to A. Okay, or similarly, y goes to a or x doesn't go to a, if they're not adjacent. Because that's, that's just exclusive or, right? x goes to a, or y goes to b. Or x goes to a, or y goes to a, I guess is what it is, exclusive or. Right, not both. And then x goes to b, or y goes to b, exclusive or. Okay, so I can write down clauses that tell me when I have two vertices belonging to the same set, EAB, can be added to the same balloon. Okay, so let's keep going. If I can't make those clauses true, fine. If I can, well, what else could happen? Okay, so, so here's a guy X who is in EAB and here's a guy Y who's in E, A, E, and they're adjacent. Now, remember the template. So if I add X to B and Y to E, then the edge from X to Y cuts across the template and that's not okay. So if I put X in B, then Y better go to A. If I put X in A, then, well, actually Y could possibly go to A as well, but it go to E. So, so I have to forbid X goes to B and Y goes to E, and that's what that does. Okay. One more possibility is that X belongs to EAB, Y belongs to EDE, and those have no vertices in common. 
So there's only one way that I can put these down. If I put x in b, there's nothing that I can do to y that won't cause me to have an edge across the template. So the only way that I, could, I can do these, if I have something like this, is x has to go into the clique containing a, and y has to go into the clique containing e, and that's it. Okay, so sx is in alphabetical order, so x must go in the clique containing a, and not sy, because y does not go in the clique containing d. Right, so it's, it's, the s statement is it goes in the lower one. Okay, so this says, so this means that x, x must go to a, and y must go to e, and possibly you're already in trouble because those other clauses say you can't add them. But then you can't make all the clauses true. Okay. And that's it. So, you have the partition that you want, if and only if, you can take that collection of Boolean clauses and make them all true at the same time. Now it turns out there's an algorithm to decide if you can do that. There are actually several. There's one based on directed graphs and there's one based on a technique called resolution. So you can efficiently decide if you can make those clauses true. If you can't, then that means that for that choice of five vertices that I got started with, I can't do it. I move on to my next choice of five, I repeat the process. I might have to do it for every choice of five, but five is a constant and I'm allowed to do that. Okay? If I can make those clauses simultaneously true, then it tells me, the truth of the variables tells me exactly what part each vertex goes to. Okay? Because they belong to E something something, and if this variable is true, then it goes to the lower part, and that's okay, and if it's false, then it goes to the higher part, and that's okay. Okay, so that's the algorithm. So, what exactly was necessary to make the algorithm work? Well, as Miriam noticed, the template had to be triangle free. If I have a triangle in the template, I can't do that, because the triangle is what allowed me to force things to belong to either this set or that set, the absence of a triangle. Okay, I can, I can have a big star, but I can't have an edge across. So it, make, it, it guarantees that after I've done my pre-processing, everybody's only got two options. Okay. Every non-empty graph in the family, so, that's, so by this I mean here it's complete graph, there, there's a way to get started. So there's a starter graph. Here my starter graph consisted of a single vertex. I was able to put down some little piece of it to get started and then kind of grow my family from there. Okay, now if it was a complete bipartite graph, I would end up putting down an edge. Because if you're trying to grow a complete bipartite graph, it has to be adjacent to this end or to that end. Okay? All right, so there's a starter graph that dominates the entries. Well, here, this dominates a complete graph. If it was a complete bipartite graph that I was trying to put into each balloon, then the two vertices, two adjacent vertices that got myself started, this guy dominates that side, this guy dominates that side. Okay? And then membership in the family can be tested in polynomial time. So I can certainly test easily if it's a complete graph. I can test if it's a star. Or I can test if it's a complete bipartite graph. I can test a whole bunch of other things. So this is really what I needed to get it going. And then I was able to write down the Boolean clauses to make things happen. So let's go a little farther with that. This is horrible. Okay, so the three points there address the three points that I had, and you might ask why you should care about that big definition. <laughs> okay, so just for the moment, let's just say we have this complicated object called a starter matrix class, which somehow is going to consist of a starter and a matrix. Okay, and that's going to be the description of the graph class, without worrying about the whole page. And here's the theorem. If I have one of these special classes of graphs, then this is what I want. Then the conditional coloring problem, so partition into these things, with that condition, so membership in that class, and a triangle-free template can be tested in polynomial time. Okay, so that, that's what I was after, 
I mean, it might not be the most general version. In fact, I can tell you it's not. Um, but this is a way of getting at a big class, a big collection of classes of graphs for which these kind of theorems hold. I have a question. Yeah. The, the condition of uh, temple must be constant. You have to put this condition, no? The, the template is, con is constant. It's fixed and advanced. Ah, uh, it's fixed. Yeah. Uh, okay. and, and, the condi and so for the purposes of this discussion, it's the same condition at every vertex as well of the template. Yeah. Now, in the end, it doesn't have to be. Okay, we can have different conditions at different vertices, but... The template size must be constant. Yeah, the template size is, size is fixed. The template is known, it never changes. No, no, no. My, my point is that the template size, for example, we have five. Right. This, this cannot grow. This no. size cannot grow. That's right. Ah, yeah. Okay. So that's not a parameter, it's a constant. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. It's a good question. What about the uh, dichotomy? You... Okay, well, I'll, we'll get there. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so, so this is what I said. Um, I'm, I'm, never, I'm not going to do this, but you could use different conditions at each vertex. In fact, you can use a finite union of conditions at each vertex, and that's okay. And it doesn't change anything. Because yeah. it's Yeah. Yeah, and it, it doesn't, it just, it just changes the constants in the polynomial time algorithm. It doesn't change really anything else, but it's, it's hard to talk about. You know, that this thing is going to be a, a complete graph or a complete bipartite graph or a star or, uh, you know, or something else. I, you don't, I'm just going to use the same condition at each vertex. It's, it's a little more clean. And sometimes, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain to you what sometimes means. You can prove that when H has a triangle, the problems are NP-complete. So sometimes you can get a dichotomy theorem and sometimes you can't. And the one example of a dichotomy theorem I have on here isn't quite true. I'm going to, you know, I, I, I saw a talk by this guy, uh, you know, named Barry Cipra? Do you know who he is? So, so Barry Cipra is a, a mathematical writer. So that's, that's his job, is he writes about mathematics. And I, I went to a, a presentation by him one day about writing about mathematics sort of for a, for a general audience, how you, how you present it so people can understand. And basically he said, you lie. You, 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 tell, you, tell, you tell little lies for the sake of clarity. So the, the example that he used, which was great, is define a fractal. So I mean, we can talk about these complex functions that you iterate and, you know. He, he said, a fractal is an object that looks the same at every level of magnification. Which is not an entirely true statement. But it really gets the picture across. And so I'm going to lie to you in a minute. <laughs> Okay, so let's go back to these starter matrix classes. And we try to relate this to what I've got. So S is a fixed starter graph. Over here, S was a single vertex. But I'm saying it's, it's some kind of graph. Okay? I, now I relates to the matrix. So it's a collection of non-empty subsets of the vertices of S. Now that doesn't help because that, my starter graph has only, over here has only one vertex. Okay? But if my starter graph was this, if I was trying to grow complete bipartite graphs, then my starter graph is going to look like this. Uh, I guess I should probably go S1, S2. And the condition that I'm trying to say is if I take any other vertex and I'm going to add it to this part, then its neighbors with respect to S, so maybe it's adjacent to only S1, maybe it's adjacent to only S2, maybe it's adjacent to both. Okay? But this, these guys here tell me what the neighbors are allowed to be. So if I was trying to grow a complete bipartite graph, then my I would consist of just S1 or just S2. Because I'm trying to make it complete bipartite, then either it's going to go in the left part, in which case it's going to be adjacent to S2, or it's going to go in the right part, in which case it's going to be just adjacent to just S1. Okay? So this, this collection of things are going to help determine the structure of my graph. All right. Now, M is a, a horrible matrix, and it's indexed by, I'll do some examples in a sec, and it's indexed by the entries in I, and the entries of M are either 1 or 0 or star, and what you have to think of is, if you see a 1, then you have all possible edges, if you see a 0, you have no edges at all, and if you see a star, you just don't care. You're allowed to have anything. Okay. Now, okay. 
I, I will do some examples. This is, this is a real mouthful and it's hard to get your brain around it. So let's, let's have a look at some little examples. Okay. So, my starter graph is K1. Okay, so remember now, I'm not talking about the partition, I'm only talking to you about what goes on inside a balloon. Okay? My index set is just the single vertex V1. So what I'm saying is that whatever vertex I add to this graph, it has to be adjacent to V1. Okay? So that, that's the only neighborhood that's allowed for a vertex that's coming in. Okay, and my M is a 1. So now, I've got to be careful. So my rows and columns, I won't put the brackets down, are indexed by the entries in I. Okay, so this tells me the structure of the vertices that are adjacent to I compared to the vertices that are adjacent, sorry, the vertices that are adjacent to V1 compared to the vertices that are adjacent to V1. And I see a 1, which means I see all possible edges. Okay? So what that's telling me is in here, I better see every possible edge. So this here is going to describe, well, what you see, a complete graph. Okay, so that, so that, this is one, so the complete graphs, which is what I just did, is, is an example of one of these classes of graphs. Okay. Okay, so here's another one. So same thing, except now I'm saying zero. Okay, so every vertex that comes in has to be adjacent to V1, because that's what the I tells me. There's a starter graph, and everybody that comes in is adjacent to some, vertex, some vertices in the starter graph. And whatever set the vertices that happens to be, that's given to you in I. So everything that comes in is adjacent to V1. Okay. And then my matrix okay, tells me what happens to vertices adjacent to V1 versus vertices adjacent to V1. And it's a zero, so I see no edges. So that's the structure. And those are stars. So you remember in the beginning I told you complete graphs, stars, complete bipartite graphs. They all had the same algorithmic technique. Okay, so, there, so there's two of them. Those are stars. Okay, so here, here's the skill testing question. Which graphs are these? They're not complete bipartite. Well, I guess you see the picture. I, I guess I gave it away. Okay. So the vertices that come in, they, their neighbors with respect to what's going on have to be in S, uh, and they have to be specified by I, so they're just V1. Dominating. What's that? Dominating. Yeah, yeah, graphs of the dominating vertex. Mm -hmm. Right, because I, I can see edges down here, not see edges down here, I, I just don't care anymore. What happens is that this vertex dominates them. All right. Here's one that's a little harder. Yeah, there is, but I'm, but I'm going to draw the picture anyway because it, it just helps me understand. So S is K2, okay? And so whatever happens, these two vertices dominate what goes on inside on, in the graph, okay? Every other vertex is joined to, it could be they're probably joined to each other, but it's joined to vertices in that K2, either it's joined to V1 or it's joined to V2, but it can't be joined to both. Okay? So I can have a vertex that's joined to V1, I can have another vertex that's joined to V2. Right? Now, what's going on with M? On the diagonal, I see zeros. So the vertices that are joined to V1, I got no edges among them. The vertices that are joined to V2, I got no edges among them. What's going on off the diagonal? I see ones. So the vertices that are joined to V1, compared to the vertices that are joined to V2, I see all possible edges. Okay. So what graphs are those? 
They're complete by partite graphs. Okay, so there's another example. Okay, if I was going to go a little farther, you can imagine what's going on here. Okay, S is a complete graph. Just think of it as a triangle for the moment. Okay? So in fact, let's just draw it. I'm going to have to draw a little bit differently. So let, let's just suppose it's K3. Okay, so uh, V1, V2, V3. Okay. My index set is the set of two subsets. So every vertex that comes in is adjacent to exactly two of them. Okay, so it's either adjacent to those two, or to those two, or to those two. Okay. My matrix has diagonal zeros. So the set of guys that are joined to those two has no edges, the set of guys that are joined to those two has no edges, the set of guys that are joined to those two has no edges. Okay? And it has off diagonal ones. So in other words, if I look at any two parts, I see all possible edges. What graphs are those? Those are complete three partite graphs. And you can imagine now, maybe because we've seen two and three, we can pretend we're engineers new induction. And um, you know, if it's a complete graph of size k, and I have this, and I have diagonal zeros and off diagonal ones, those are complete k partite graphs. Okay, so they fit in the family as well. Now, I don't know if I have another one. Mm. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about the wreath product. But I am curious about that last one. Okay, graphs of bounded diameter. So. I, I want to prove to you that graphs of bounded diameter fit into this family. Okay, so suppose I say that I want the diameter to be no more than four. Just, just okay, so that's, that's what I mean by bounded, bounded by a constant. All right, so, so what's going to happen? Well, if it's no more than, maybe, let me make it five, it'll be just a little bit better. So, so, I'm, I'm, so this is what I'm shooting for, is diameter less than or equal to 5. Okay, so that means that between any two vertices, I see a path of length no more than 5. Okay, so as my starter, I'm going to take P3. Because I'm going to hang some guys off of here and hang some guys off of there, and that's my 5. Okay. Now, what's going on? Okay, so, so now, where are things allowed to be adjacent? Okay, well, they could be adjacent just to this vertex. Because those are going to be the guys at the end of the five path. They could be adjacent just to this vertex. It's the other end of the five path. They could be adjacent just to this, they could be adjacent just to this, or they could be adjacent to those two, or they could be adjacent just to those two, or in fact they could be adjacent to all three of those and I don't care. Okay? So I'm basically taking all of the subsets of this that are non-empty and admitting those as my set I. Okay, so, so, um, so my S is my path on three vertices, my I is the power set, this is kind of horrible, of the vertex set of P3 take away the empty set, right? So it, has, it can be adjacent to any collection of vertices in there, but it has to be adjacent to some of them. Because that, that was my condition. Okay. And then, what, then what, what's going on with my matrix? What's happening in the matrix? Okay, so M, M is like this. What, what am I going to allow? So, for instance, am I going to allow 
edges between these. Or maybe if I have something like that, am I allowed to have an edge from here to here? Right, so it, so it doesn't change the diameter, right? It certainly won't ever make it bigger than five. Okay, so my matrix is just stars everywhere. Right, because I, I just don't care. I, all, all that really matters to get the diameter less than or equal to five is that I know where these are adjacent with respect to that path of length three. Okay, and so similarly you can do some other things, but just graphs of bounded diameter I wanted to get to. Okay? All right. So, all right, so now, having spent a whole bunch of time telling you uh, what's going on with a, what a starter matrix class is and what you can describe with them. Okay, so if I have a starter matrix class, so I have a triangle-free template, okay? So now I'm, I'm, now I'm going to partition in the blobs. My, t my template is triangle-free. If I have a starter matrix class, I can test membership in the class in polynomial time because that's what the matrix lets me do. Right? I can find S in there. I can check the neighborhoods. I can check the structures that are specified by the matrix. Okay? And it's exactly the same as before. I choose the starters, but now they're graphs. But the graphs are of fixed size, so I can do that. And I might have to go through all possible choices. Okay? Some choices are going to be forced because the template is triangle free. Otherwise, you're going to have choices of two things. You can write down a bunch of two variable clauses to say where something has to go. Okay? The algorithm is exactly the same. So this is a method that does what the referee asked happen. It unifies all of the other stuff and extends it a little bit. It's kind of complicated. All right. Um, don't worry about this. This, is, this part's the lie anyway. <laughs> okay. When H is triangle free, Conditional coloring with condition C and template H. Okay, so this is first starter matrix class C. It's polynomial. H has a triangle. The problem is NP complete. So just think of this as being complete multipartite. Okay, there's a there's a small a small subtlety, but but the, the basic idea is that um, in in your starter graph. You've got the set I of where the other vertices are supposed to be adjacent. As long as that's inclusion free, this theorem holds. Okay, now maybe that's not completely true. It's inclusion free and you have zeros on the diagonal or ones on the diagonal. And you don't care what happens off the diagonal. Okay? Um, but I want to point out to you that the dichotomy doesn't always exist. It's, well, I mean, it exists, but it's not the same. So if my condition is has a dominating vertex, so we, we saw that, right? That was um, a single vertex starter and the matrix was a star. Okay? Well, this part's still true. That was a theorem, and it's right. And so if the triangle, is, if the template is triangle free, you're good. But complete graphs have lots of triangles, and it's still polynomial. Because what you're doing here is you're just testing if the graph has a dominating set of size at most the number of vertices of H. That's a constant and you can do that. Okay, But if H is a big enough complete multipartite graph, the problem does eventually become NP complete. So there, there is a dichotomy probably, we just don't get to know what it is. Um, the same thing happens for graphs of bounded diameter. So um, it's true that if your template is triangle free, Partition into graphs of bounded diameter is good, but it's also true that if your template is complete, partition into graphs of bounded diameter is in P. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions?